Hey, how's it going guys? I have a pretty special announcement. Tomorrow, or technically today, is the 4th of July, and I have made a special sale uh, on the Liberal Tier Mugs. Uh, through the 4th of July, there will be a 40% discount code on Liberal Tier Mugs, so be sure to go ahead and check them out. If you're ever going to get one, now is the chance. First link in the description. Thank you guys for watching the video. Let's get right to it. My question to you is how do you defend something like global warming where it's really very obvious how the Democrats are doing the right thing and the majority of Republicans are not? Let me ask you a question if I may. To me, um, global warming is a little bit like um, theism in the sense that it's a factual claim, right? It's a factual claim, moreover, that's not visible to our senses. If you were to tell me, for example, that there is a God and he has these characteristics, um, I might see it or I might not. But it's not like you telling me that, it's, that there's a tree, because I can see a tree, right? You can see the tree. So if I don't see the tree, I have something's wrong with my eyesight, right? But if I don't see God in the way that you see him, it's not, because I don't, I, it's not because I lack eyes. I see the same facts that you do. I just don't agree with your interpretation of evidence that is a little opaque to our senses, right? So here's global warming. My question to you is why is it to you a moral issue? Either the earth is getting hotter or it's not. We don't feel it getting hotter, right? You're looking at one set of data. I'm looking at one set of data. Let's say we disagree over what this data means. We don't disagree about temperatures by themselves. We disagree about the cause of those temperatures and the significance of them and what we should do about them. For example, let's say you were to tell me that in the next room, the temperature is 800 degrees, right? Or let's say the temperature is 110 degrees. I have two choices. I can go in there and say, how do I change the planet? to bring the temperature down from 110 to, let's say, a livable 90. Or I can say, maybe I should take off my jacket and try to adapt myself to the climate instead of trying to adapt the world to me. Which is easier? Is it easier for us to adapt to global change that is massive, has been occurring over millennia, and it's very unclear how we can address it? or? Is it really worth, so what I'm getting at is, where's the moral issue here? What's, what's moral about it? I mean, the moral consequences of not doing anything about global warming, you know? And the people that are supposed to suffer a lot because of not dealing with global warming, especially the, the poor people in uh, Africa and in many places that are very affected by rising sea levels or lack of vegetation or food. But my question is, Maybe they're wrong, maybe they're wrong, but wouldn't you just would like to bet that they're right for the, you know, don't you think it's m much more beneficial? I mean, obviously it's not for the people that have oil companies, but you and many other people, wouldn't you just want to bet that they're probably right, that most of the scientific community is right about global warming and you want to, you would like to change how we live and change resources? Like, would you just want to bet for that? Well, look, I come from a poor country, India, right? India is trying to go from being a third world country to being a second world country. Now, what this means in terms of human welfare is we're talking about hundreds of millions of people going from starvation to basically having one or two meals a day, right? They're, we're not talking about becoming rich. We're talking about a country climbing out of the most degrading type of poverty. They, India cannot do it without energy, without oil, without the, the, essentially the lifeblood of an economy. India and China, the two greatest human success stories in the world in the last 30 years, have come up by massively increasing their demands on world energy. They need it desperately. Brazilian, poor Brazilians desperately need land and they need farming and they need logs and they need timber and they need paper. 
So these resources are not some world luxury. They're the very basis of the poorest of the poor, the wretched of the earth, climbing up in the world. So it's a complete fallacy to see the global warming debate as between oil companies and, and idealistic environmentalists. That locates the whole debate in the West as if it's just some argument between Exxon and Brandeis. No, that's not where the fight is taking place. Poor countries need stuff to grow. They need food, they need fertilizer. So if you start classifying no fossil fuels, no this, no that, tax on this, tax on that, no oil, uh, the point is you're not hurting the rich guys. I don't care about Exxon. You're actually hurting all these poor people who need this stuff to come up. That's why you'll never see big global warming demonstrations in Mumbai, unless they're staged by the government. They'll, they'll never occur. Just like you never see protests against multinational corporations in Mumbai. You go try and you put up a sign that says Nike, and the next day there'll be 500 people standing in line. <laughs> Why? That's, that's the, so so I'm, I'm simply trying to alert you as someone who's grown up on the other side of the world, as you apparently have, that this is actually a much more complex issue. And so my, it's not that I have a side in global warming. It's not my issue. It's just that when I hear these extravagant claims that, are, that have no empirical experiential support at all, uh, I'm on my guard. That's all I'm saying. Okay, next question. Hey, and I didn't say this, you said this. I'm a beneficiary of illicit white privilege. Okay? Illicit? Why well, is it all white privilege illicit? Ill is it deserved? Well, in this, I mean, in this current system, there is legality. I mean, that... illicit means immoral. Okay. Then... Immoral white okay. privilege. Yeah. Okay. So then, if I were to say to you, there are surely many deserving minorities who would like to come to Amherst but have the inherited disadvantage of American history. Therefore, since you are an acknowledged beneficiary of illicit privilege, would you be willing to step aside voluntarily, putting your own moral mouth where your uh, self-proclaimed virtue is, and give your seat, your seat, not my seat, I realize you may be super generous with other people's advantages, and favor affirmative action, so other white kids who apply to Amherst are turned away, to open spaces for minorities. But I'm not talking about you acting out your virtue on them. I'm talking about you acting out your virtue on you. Mm -hmm. Are you willing to give up your illicit seat that you don't deserve here at Amherst to make room for a disadvantaged minority, yes or no? Okay, well, let me start here. I don't know how you got on the topic of affirmative action. By following I, the logic of I, your... No, no, I, I never said specifically that I think that race-based affirmative action is the best way to rectify um, the systems of injustice that... Why don't sorry? you practice it by stepping out? And, and why don't you go to the registrar tomorrow and tell him you want to withdraw from Amherst? Are you listening to what he just said? Get off. Yeah. I'm listening. Go ahead. Okay, well, but, I mean, I, Look, I, I'm only continuing to engage because you continue to engage with me, and I, I do want to hear other people's questions. But in response to that, again, what you're trying to demonstrate is that everyone's hypocritical. As someone once said that we're all we're all dirty up to our arms, right? We're, we're not all perfect. None of us is perfectly morally consistent. Now, I've said absolutely nothing about affirmative action. The fact is that I believe everyone in this room is hypocritical to some degree. But that doesn't mean that we shouldn't strive for a more just and equitable system entirely. Um, there have been points in my life in which I have given up uh, some of the privileges with, it, with which I have been endowed simply because I realized that it wasn't the right thing to do. At the same time, I think everyone needs to survive and that we, ex we understand that we exist in an in imperfect system and that we have to conduct our business in such a way as to not only adhere to our moral standards, but to the standards imposed upon us by the system in which we live. And I, I think that we have to be generous to people people and their efforts to not be hypocritical and then do their best, but I don't think that we should totally throw away the idea that we shouldn't have those standards at all. Um, and so that's my response to you, but I would still like a response to my question regarding the inequity that I talked about uh, with the uh, U.S. Department of Veterans Affairs. That is wealth that is passed down, and it's documentable wealth. The same way that the wealth created, or the wealth stolen as a product of slavery was also documentable 
unspeakable wealth. We have numbers that demonstrate precisely how much wealth was stolen, and that's money that in some way could be given back. Now, if we're saying that it's absolutely impossible to give that money back because it's too hard to trace, we'd have to uh, give money to the African tribes, we'd have to give money to people who are no longer exist, that's absolutely fine, but we have to understand that we haven't really come to terms with that injustice that's been perpetrated, and if we are admitting that no one um, that no one is perfectly entitled to absolutely everything that their uh, ancestors were, uh, had stolen from them, then we also have to accept that there are people today who benefit from the fact that their parents and grandparents profited from this immoral system. And, and the way to deal with that is with a social safety net that enables everyone to thrive. I'll, I'll, I'll leave you there. <clears throat> yes. Well. The, the core of the American system, this will actually answers your question directly, is that how do, what do we do about the conquest ethic of the past? And here there are two options. There are two options. One option is we establish equal rights under the law. That was the solution of the civil rights movement, that we have had race-based discrimination, we've had racial hierarchy. Let's stop. Let's treat people according to the color of this, according to the content of their character. Equal rights under the law. <laughs> Equal rights under the law. The other option, which you're defending, is you could essentially call it, let's correct for history. Let's correct for history. Let's try to find out who are the people in possession of stolen goods, and let's return it. Now, the first thing I'm trying to say is, this is a hugely controversial principle because it actually involves wrecking the freedom of a free society. You basically have to, to put it frankly, if we were to carry that out, go into people's homes and take their stuff. Take their furniture, take their cars. You don't seem to have even the guts to do that. You don't have the moral self-confidence to do it yourself. It may be, if I am advocating a rule of social justice and I'm advocating it for the whole society, before I persuade everybody else, let's say I'm a, I'm a, I'm a Christian and I believe everybody should give 10% of their wealth to help the poor. And I go, you know what? There, the Bible says this, the Bible says that everybody should give 10% of their wealth to help the poor. And somebody says, Dinesh, are you giving 10% of your wealth? And I'm like, actually no, but I did do some tutoring. And you go, wait a minute, aren't you advocating? Aren't you saying that there is a moral duty to do this? Why don't you do it? Before you convince us, you do it. And you're like, I don't think I should do it because society is extremely complex. And I don't think I should do it unless everybody else does it. No. Either you believe in it and you do it. Once you've done it, you might impress us. And then you might convince the rest of us that our wealth is also ill-gotten. But you can't do it. And I'm not trying to indict everybody of hypocrisy, only you. Because, because you're the one, you're the one who said. Hello everyone, hey, I'm just stopping by to remind you that liberals are insane. Social justice warriors are becoming more violent and triggered than ever before. Anyways, be sure to subscribe to KGP TV on YouTube and have a blessed day. Yeah, man. Ten to let's say a livable ninety, or I can say maybe I should take off my jacket and try to adapt myself to the climate instead of trying to adapt the world to me. Which is easier? Is it easier for us to adapt to global change that is massive, has been occurring over millennia, and it's very unclear how we can address it? Or is it really worth... So what I'm getting at is, where's the moral issue here? What's, what's moral about it? I mean, the moral consequences of not doing anything about global warming, you know? And the people that are supposed to suffer a lot because of not dealing with global warming, especially the, the poor people in uh, Africa and in many places that are very affected by rising sea levels or lack of vegetation or food. But my question is, 
maybe they're wrong. Maybe they're wrong, but wouldn't you just would like to bet that they're right for the, you know? Don't you think it's m much more beneficial? I mean, obviously it's not for the people that have oil companies, but you and many other people, wouldn't you just want to bet that they're probably right, that most of the scientific community is right about global warming and you want to, you would like to change how we live and change resources? Like, would you just want to bet for that? Well, look, I come from a poor country, India, right? India is trying to go from being a third world country to being a second world country. Now, what this means in terms of human welfare is we're talking about hundreds of millions of people going from starvation to basically having one or two meals a day, right? There, we're not talking about becoming rich. We're talking about a country climbing out of the most degrading type of poverty. They, India cannot do it without energy, without oil, without the, the, essentially the lifeblood of an economy. India and China, the two greatest human success stories in the world in the last 30 years, have come up by massively increasing their demands on world energy. They need it, desperately. Brazilian, poor Brazilians desperately need land, and they need farming, and they need logs, and they need timber, and they need paper. So these resources are not some world luxury. They're the very basis of the poorest of the poor, the wretched of the earth, climbing up in the world. So it's a complete fallacy to see the global warming debate as between oil companies and, and idealistic environmentalists. That locates the whole debate in the West, as if it's just some argument between Exxon and Brandeis. No, that's not where the fight is taking place. Poor countries need stuff to grow. They need food, they need fertilizer. So if you start classifying no fossil fuels, no this, no that, tax on this, tax on that, no oil, uh, the point is you're not hurting the rich guys. I don't care about Exxon. You're actually hurting all these poor people who need this stuff to come up. That's why you'll never see big global warming demonstrations in Mumbai, unless they're staged by the government. They'll, they'll never occur. Just like you never see protests against multinational corporations. I can see a tree, right? You can see the tree. So if I don't see the tree, I have something's wrong with my eyesight, right? But if I don't see God in the way that you see him, it's not because I don't, I, it's not because I lack eyes. I see the same facts that you do. I just don't agree with your interpretation of evidence that is a little opaque to our senses, right? So here's global warming. My question to you is, why is it, to you, a moral issue? Either the Earth is getting hotter, or it's not. We don't feel it getting hotter, right? You're looking at one set of data, I'm looking at one set of data. Let's say we disagree over what this data means. We don't disagree about temperatures by themselves, we disagree about the cause of those temperatures and the significance of them, and what we should do about them. For example, Let's say you were to tell me that in the next room, the temperature is 800 degrees, right? Or let's say the temperature is 110 degrees. I have two choices. I can go in there and say, how do I change the planet to bring the temperature down from 110? Hey, how's it going, guys? I have a pretty special announcement. Tomorrow, or technically today, is the 4th of July, and I have made a special sale uh, on the Liberal Tier Mugs. Uh, through the 4th of July, there will be a 40% discount code on Liberal Tier Mug, so be sure to go ahead and check them out. If you're ever going to get one, now is the chance. First link in the description. Thank you guys for watching the video. Let's get right to it. Well, my question to you is how do you defend something like global warming where it's really very obvious how the r Democrats are doing the right thing and the majority of Republicans are not? Let me ask you a question if I may. To me, um, global warming is a little bit like um, theism in the sense that it's a factual claim, right? It's a factual claim, moreover, that's not visible to our senses. If you were to tell me, for example, that there is a God and he has these characteristics, um, I might see it or I might not. But it's not like you telling me that, it's, that there's a tree.